Hello and welcome to the Summer School and YouTube channel. And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, hello and welcome to the podcast. My name is Nico, and if you can't tell already, I am very excited to share this interview with you today. Why? Because I got to talk to the great Natalie Wexler. She's not just an educational journalist. She's a great writer, and she delivered an amazing piece of work with the book, The Knowledge Gap. I know that I gave it a plug in the beginning of the interview, but I'm going to give another plug in because it's just that good. Okay. If you want to learn about the challenges of teaching reading and writing and literacy, literacy skills in general in elementary school, this is the book to go and start your adventure to, under, to better understanding. And hopefully this conversation leads you to buy the book too because she's as, as knowledgeable and as, as fruitful as our conversation was. It, it it can't hold a candle to all the information that she she shares in this book. So please give it a chance, buy it. If you're a teacher and you need some guidance on how you can possibly teach writing better in your own classroom, give it a look-see at The Writing Revolution. Uh, Natalie Wexler did not uh, create this on her own. This was actually started by Judith Hockman. Uh, Natalie was just a co-author on this on this program so feel free get the book find out more information on how you can create a better environment for writing and reading in your classroom so i hope you enjoy the interview like and subscribe to the channel buy the book and check out the website enjoy bye all right we are recording. So uh, hello and welcome to the Summer Schooling uh, YouTube channel. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, hello and welcome to the podcast. Uh, on this channel and on this podcast, I talk about mostly everything in education and sometimes stuff out of it. Uh, if you haven't already, please like the video, uh, subscribe to the channel. All the engagement helps. And I bring guaranteed content to you every Friday. And this with this video, I'm very excited because today I will be talking to someone who can shed light, not just to me, but hopefully anyone viewing this on the treasure that is reading and writing and how it is taught in schools. Um, quick context, I, in my two years teaching, I was very, I was only focused on teaching reading and writing. I didn't have to teach math because I was lucky to have co-teachers. Um, and I, I, I was able to have in my last school year a principal that gave me full flexibility with how I can teach the subjects. When she introduced the curriculum to me, it was in these very bland uh, readers. And I told her that this was, this was what made me allergic to liking reading and writing in elementary school. And that's coming from someone who didn't fall in love with those two things until 19, at the age of 19. So I was lucky to have that principle. But I'm even luckier to talk to the guests that I have today, because hopefully she can help me understand just how complex this whole, uh, this these all these methodologies and all these uh, pedagogical practices are running in schools. And um, I will say at points in the year where I was doubting my approach to teaching these subjects, I came across her work and it comforted me uh, because it made me have valid reasons to why I wasn't, I wasn't so eager to just teach children's skills in knowing the main idea and writing three bullet points to go along with it. And it's, I, this, this guest today has delivered some pretty incredibly thoughtful work and in this book, which I do not keep dust covers, <laughs> as I've told with my interview with uh, uh, Charles Love, although this is a very beautiful book without the dust cover, uh, in this book, The Knowledge Gap, um, she offers a kaleidosc kaleidoscopic view on literacy in schools. Um, her work has inspired me, it has motivated me, and most importantly, it has challenged me. So without further ado, my guest today, uh, Natalie Wexler. Hello. Hi, Nico, and thank you for that very kind introduction. And I'm glad to hear that the book provided you with some support <laughs> while you were 
and gave to me incredibly difficult job of teaching reading and writing. <laughs> yes, uh, but it's it really. I mean, I I am reading it now that I don't necessarily teach in a classroom. I listen to your interviews prior during the school year, um, and. Uh, I gotta say it's, it's, we'll, we'll talk more about it. I think I'd like for you to get a chance to introduce yourself to the listener and the viewer. Uh, I know what you do and you mostly write about education, but how would you describe a day at the office for yourself? Well, I, I don't know. I mean, I have the luxury of being able to, you know, do whatever I want pretty much. So the yeah. days are kind of not, um, standardized, but I, yes, I, I write about education. So I have, written this book, uh, The Knowledge Gap, that came out three years ago, almost exactly, in August of 2019. And I'm also the co-author of a book uh, called The Writing Revolution with Judith Hockman, which I hope we'll also get a chance to talk about. And that came out in 2017. And uh, since the books came out, I've been writing for Forbes uh, as a contributor. And I also have my own Substack newsletter called Minding the Gap, where I'm able to republish basically the content that's appeared on Forbes after five days and it has no paywall and no ads. So, yes. um, so I, I, I basically apply this lens um, that I have come to through writing these books to all sorts of issues in education. And um, the the problems that I've focused on in those books have enormous ramifications. So I am there is no shortage of things for me to write about. I am. I also travel and you know do remote presentations um, about the books, and it is amazing to me that even three years after the knowledge gap has come out, I would I would say there's more interest now. I'm getting more requests for speaking engagements and podcasts like this now than I did um, shortly after the book came out. So um, it's I think you know I it seems to be at least in some parts of the country really having some impact on educators and um, our, you know, education system is huge, but yes. at least some uh, impact on what we do in classrooms. So that's been tremendously gratifying. So did you have a moment in your life that was the catalyst to, I want to write about schools and what's going on? Were you, were you just writing and then something happened that you couldn't ignore and you wanted to explore? Well, it was a more gradual than that. Um, I, and I, Actually, it started. Um, I'd been writing novels. <laughs> um, I know. I saw that. That was. I'd love to talk about that. <laughs> I've done a bunch of different things, but I had also had a background in journalism, and I got interested in education. I live in Washington D.C., where, you know, ten, twelve years ago, when I started writing about education, um, there was a tremendous amount of education reform activity. And I could see there wasn't enough coverage. And, and I had just gotten extremely interested in it because it seemed incredibly important to me to figure out why there's this thing we call the achievement gap or sometimes call that, it, you know, the, the, the gap in test scores and other education outcomes basically between kids at the upper and lower ends of the socioeconomic spectrum. And so I wanted to understand that, understand why we'd made so little progress in narrowing that gap and I thought writing about it would both maybe be sort of a public service. I was writing for a local sort of news website um, and also help me understand what was going on. But I have to say that I did not, into, you know, all by myself arrive at the insights that led me to the knowledge gap. Um, I started out thinking, because many others have thought this and still do, that the real problem was high school. And that's, you know, that's where these the scores are the lowest and the um, gap is the widest and the students are often the most disengaged. And it seemed like we were making progress at the elementary level. I mean, I would be taken in to look at these elementary school classrooms and all the kids were, you know, bright eyed and bushy tailed and the scores were sort of gradually going up and the gap was gradually narrowing. And the question seemed to be, what, we're making gains at the element and the lower grade levels. Why aren't they carrying over to upper grade levels where suddenly students seem to not be doing very well? And really what I what was eventually explained to me, I should say, was that um, the problems that become so obvious at the high school level don't begin there. They actually have their origins in what I thought was the bright spot in education, elementary school, and the way we approach especially 
reading or literacy. Yes. Yes. And uh, it's, it's, I, I like that in this book, it really paints how complicated it is to figure out the proper approach for teaching these skills. Um, I really enjoyed, there was a presentation many years ago by Roland Fryer in which he tried to uh, find the, the recipe that these, these uh, lower income charter schools were delivering high proficiency scores. Uh, and he wanted to understand how to do it. And he came up with a formula of extra tutoring time, uh, parent kind of colleges and other things. And at the end of his study, the math scores improved dramatically, but reading and writing still was the, the tricky part. Why do you think that is? Well, that's very typical. It's It's been known for a long time that it's easier to boost math scores than reading scores. Um, and I would say also, it's easier to boost reading scores at lower grade levels because they are largely reflective of whether kids can decode, whether they can decipher words. And so that's relatively easy to teach. We don't do a very good job of that, but that's relatively easy to teach. But starting at third grade, the tests, reading tests purport to test comprehension. And that is much, much more difficult to teach. In fact, I would say you cannot teach directly teach reading comprehension, but that is what we spend a lot of time on. So to answer your question though, I mean, math is this, compared to reading, it's really yeah. a closed system, right? There's a there's a limited universe of concepts that you can teach. And, um, you know, this, these are not things that kids are likely to sort of pick up at home. But when it comes to, so, it, you know, school can make a, a more noticeable difference everybody's more or less starting from the same baseline and they're learning math in school. Reading, and here I'm talk about, talking about reading comprehension, uh, is largely dependent on academic knowledge and vocabulary. Um, and kids from more highly educated families who in our society also tend to be wealthier families, they are better able to pick up that kind of knowledge and vocabulary at home it more or less effortlessly because their parents are using those, those words. They maybe, you know, are taking them to museums or taking them on trips or whatever, but there are all sorts of reasons why those kids come into school with more academic knowledge and vocabulary, and that enables them to read at a quote unquote higher level. Yeah. The other kids who depend on school for that kind of information, for that knowledge, that vocabulary, they don't generally do not get it there. In fact, they're less likely to get it there than kids who are going to schools in more affluent areas because educators and the whole system, this is not any individual's fault, it's not teacher's fault, but you look at those reading tests and you think they're testing skills. And actually this focus on comprehension skills, like finding the main idea, making inferences, whatever, uh, predates the emphasis on reading tests, but it's really been exacerbated by over the last 20 years, the importance attached to reading tests. And so look at those reading tests, you think, well, the kids need practice on finding the main idea um, and they need to read a bunch of things on random topics because that's what they'll be asked yeah. to do on the test Yeah. Uh, to prepare them for the test. And it, so you read a, a passage on one random topic and you answer some questions about making inferences or comparing and contrasting or whatever. Then you read about another topic. And also the idea is, well, they really need to read at their individual reading level. In other words, they need to read things that are easy for them to read. It doesn't really matter what the topic is as long as they're practicing their skills yeah. on books or texts that are easy for them to read. But there is, there's really no proof that that is going to turn them into better readers. Um, and what we really need to be doing is spending more time on substantive topics like history, geography, science, those topics have the most potential to actually build the kind of academic vocabulary that kids need to do well on reading tests, not just on reading tests, but in high school and in life. And yet what happens in schools where test scores are low is that they cut out what limited time is allotted for social studies, science, to spend more time practicing those reading skills because it's thought that's the way to boost reading scores. So in our well-intentioned efforts to boost reading scores for the kids who score, who score the lowest, we have been really shooting ourselves in the foot. Yeah, 
<laughs> I, I, when you, when you talk about reading levels, it's like nails on a chalkboard to me at this point, mm -hmm. because yeah. I, I would constantly have voluntary reading clubs and book clubs for my students. And I remember one year I gave the, I was teaching fourth grade and I gave them the book holes. And when I talked to, um, when I talked to colleagues, uh, just during our kind of teacher talk time, uh, when I told them that I, I gave this students holes, they were, they were just flabbergasted. Like that's a V level book. They, there's no way that they should be reading that right now. And, and I, I just couldn't comprehend why, why is having a student read something way above their reading level, uh, negative if they, they, they rise to the challenge and they're excited to challenge. Like I've had dyslexic students who are low level readers who read way above their levels and it's, they consider it their favorite book on Charlotte's web, for example. Mm -hmm. um, I really liked in, it actually, it kind of, it kind of messed me up and I had to read it out loud to my girlfriend in terms of the, uh, you talk about having background knowledge on certain topics being the key factor instead of just giving excerpts to read. And you give an example about baseball, a study with a uh, baseball. And would you like to explain that? To the sure. Listener? Um, this is a, a frequently cited study, um, but it is not the only study of its kind. It just was really the, the first to, to do this. So the, the researchers wanted to answer the question, what is more important in reading comprehension? Is it general skill or ability of you know, finding the main ideas measured by standardized tests? Or is it how much you know about the topic you're reading about? Mm -hmm. And they chose the topic of baseball. They were doing this with seventh and eighth graders and they figured there were a lot of kids out there who were not generally good readers, but they do know a lot about baseball. So they took the kids and they divided them into four groups depending on how well they had scored on a standardized reading test and how much they knew about baseball. And then they gave them a passage to read describing a baseball game and tested their comprehension of that passage. And what they found was what really made the difference was knowledge of baseball. In fact, the kids who were poor readers according to the standardized test, but knew about baseball, they did much better than the quote unquote good readers who did not know much about baseball. Um, but I do wanna make a couple of points here. First of all, it's. Yeah. Topic knowledge is one kind of knowledge that will help, but um, the uh, really the goal is not to just have kids know about a bunch of different topics. That is the route to having general academic knowledge and vocabulary. And the more of that you have, the more likely you are to be able to understand anything you read. You know, so it's been found, for example, that there's an extremely high correlation between general academic knowledge, for example, knowing the answer to the question, in what part of the body does pneumonia occur? And general reading comprehension. So, the, the, but the only way to acquire that kind of vocabulary, and by the way, familiarity with the more complex syntax of written language is through knowledge of topics. Yeah. The other, the other thing I'd just like to mention is, um, yes, I totally agree with you. Kids should not be limited by their quote unquote reading levels, which, you know, were just kind of made up. They they seem very scientific, but they're not based in any any, any evidence really. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the caveat here is that um, I, you know, I think I have seen this in some classrooms. Teachers might feel that the way to get kids to engage, you know, in rigor is to give them some complex text on a topic they know nothing about and tell, you know, tell them to read it sometimes tell them to find the main idea, whatever. But, you know, I mean, it, it'll work sometimes, but if a kid is really um, lacking the background knowledge or the general academic vocabulary to read a certain text, it's, it's going to be probably not only a struggle, but a, a waste of precious time. And the, the most, if, before kids are fluent readers, the most efficient way to build academic knowledge and vocabulary is through reading aloud and discussion. And then, I mean, like those, those kids who did the, the poor readers who did well on that base in that baseball study, they did not learn about baseball by reading about baseball, right? Yeah, they, yeah. you know, so it's been found that kids can take in more 
complex information through listening than through their own reading, on average through about age 13. Yeah. And then once through listening to text being read aloud, because they need to get familiar with that complex syntax of written language, and talking about that content, using the vocabulary they've just heard, and talking about the concepts they've just heard, then they have that knowledge in long-term memory, and it's going to make it easier for them to read about the topic that they have now that they now know something about. So, the you know it, they do need to read, but it's it's best to build the knowledge first through listen, reading aloud and discussion, and then give them something to read on the topic, and you may be surprised at what level they can read at. I am holding back just cheesing at what you just said, because my favorite thing was always to just do live read alouds. And for my fourth and fifth graders, I would always choose specific books per unit to read through a course of four weeks. And I was teaching in my last year, fourth and fifth grade. So I would end up reading the book twice. So I would read, uh, I would read in full character voices and everything, Maniac McGee by Jerry Spinelli, uh, uh, Abby's work with Crispin. Um, I also read different level books like Fantastic Mr. Fox by Roald Dahl. And everything was just about, I, I would put on a star projector and they can see, sit freely. And it was just about listening. And I was, so, so I, I, I was going to ask you about what are the benefits of live read aloud? Because I noticed that in teaching, they kind of discourage it after third grade, maybe. I don't, I don't see, I was probably the, at least the only one that I know reading, doing read alouds for my fourth and fifth graders. I've had my teacher trainers just straight up say, we don't have time for that. Yeah. I mean, I have to confess when, before I discovered all of this that I'm talking about, I remember being brought into a middle school classroom and the teacher was reading aloud to the kids from the autobiography of Malcolm X. And I think they were wow. following along in the book. And you what could read this, by the way, sorry. Sorry. What grade, what grade was this, by the way? Middle school, so it's probably seventh, okay. sixth, seventh grade. I think All it was right. seventh grade. That's a little worried there. And and I and the kids were, you know, wrapped. And I thought at the time, why is this teacher wasting time reading aloud? I mean, these kids should be reading this for homework. And then the, and I was totally wrong. Um, I think reading aloud has tremendous power even after kids have learned to decode. I mean, it is a burden on what we call working memory, that aspect of our consciousness where we take in new information, try to make sense of it. If we, not only just decoding, but like, where does the emphasis go in this sentence? You know, how is this word pronounced? If you have an expert reader doing that work for you, then you are much better able to attend to the meaning and absorb the information and, re and retain it. And if you're, emotionally engaged. So like if it's a novel, my theory, I, well, there is evidence for this, that it's more likely to stick, that that emotional connection makes the information more likely to stick. And I will mention this, these are small studies, but there are a couple of studies, I think only one has been published in England that have gotten, I would say really hard to believe results from just reading novels aloud to kids at a fairly rapid pace. So the first study, which was done with like 14 year olds, or, um, the experiment was to just have teachers, it was basically teachers reading aloud. Um, it, it's a little you know, trickier to have students read aloud because it's yes. a burden on them. And also they may not do a great job and you know, it makes them nervous, whatever. So these were teachers mostly reading aloud, two books, two novels back to back, one classic and one contemporary. And the kids, first of all, did not often did not want the teacher to stop reading. Uh, they were very engaged in this. But after 12 weeks, so three months of doing this, they gave these kids a standardized reading test, not related to anything that they'd been listening to, standardized reading comprehension test. And they found that struggling readers, I mean, all the kids made a lot of progress, but the, the struggling readers made 16 months of progress after three months wow. on a standardized reading test. Wow. And I would say, well, maybe that was a fluke, except it was tried again with younger students, elementary le level students, and they got the same kinds of re results, it, in some cases, way more uh, of, a, of an improvement. It's hard to explain, but that's my theory, is that when you're emotionally engaged, you're more likely to remember uh, yeah. the information, the vocabulary. Well, 
I, I want to move to the next topic because I want to give you a chance to talk about the writing revolution and your work with it. And uh, I think the best way to do that is first, I want to ask you, do you have any background in teaching yourself? And I ask this for a very specific reason. Go ahead. Well, I don't have, a, I have never taught, I've tutored, but I've never taught K through 12 students. I have only taught highly motivated adults. Um, I've taught writing and I've taught um, English as a second language as a volunteer and it's a whole different ball game. You know, <laughs> and, and I'm not, and I'm, I totally welcome your ideas and what you're contributing. I would, and I'd like for you to talk about the writing revolution. I just wanted to bring up this point because I don't think a lot of people watching this or listeners may know just how in-house education can be to a detriment, I believe, um, mm -hmm. because they might see your work and what you produce and be like, never been in a classroom. Even in the book, you have multiple times you said, that, and teachers were angry that this person who's never stepped in a classroom, I feel both sides of that argument sometimes. It, I feel like a hypocrite uh, just left and right. I'm like, well, they're not in the classroom, but it might, but I don't want this to just be stay out of education, anyone who isn't graduated yeah. from the College of Education. Yeah, no, I, you know, I was very much aware of that common feeling among teachers because they, they've had a lot of experts, you know, who have not been in a classroom or maybe not in many years, these sort are of telling them what to do or, you know, and, and I perfectly understandable, I, you know, I'm a writer. I don't want somebody who's never written anything to try to tell me about writing. Yeah, I totally yeah. get that, but I, I have sort of two responses. One is, um, I this book is the result of me listening to a lot of teachers and observing them, talking to them. Uh, and I really, you know, I, I was guided by what they were telling me to a large extent. The other thing is that sometimes it is helpful to have an outsider's perspective. Sometimes you know, we are all prisoners of our own experience. And so one of my chapters is titled The Water they, They've they Been Swimming In. Um, we, we are all unaware sometimes of the water we're swimming in. And I think for teachers, you know, they are bombarded with um, messages telling them this is the right way to do things. And even if they have a gut feeling that something's missing, you know, there's just no validation for that. And so what I think a journalist like me or a writer is able to do is step back, look at what's going on in the classroom, listen to what those experts are saying, but also talk to other people, uh, cognitive scientists, read all that research and try to put it all together. Um, and I, I think, you know, ideally that's, that's what journalists can do. It's a combination of listening to the people who do have the experience you're writing about, but also bringing in other perspectives to maybe reframe the narrative. I, I completely agree with you. And I, I would go on to add, I feel like it's beneficial for just individual, well, pe individual teachers to take that kind of mindset too, because we are in, an, it's true what you said, we are inundated with experts telling us what to do. And I'm going to be fully transparent with you. I. I remember when I first started creating my, uh, making my own, I wasn't making my own curriculum because I used the, I used the benchmark program that they give, had given me and I would take the essential question and come up with a four week long process that can answer that. Um, and so I, I was like two, two units in and the RSP teacher, after I told her, yeah, I'm creating my own stuff. She said, oh, you, well, you, you know what you should do is you should uh, find this stuff, the writing revolution. It's amazing and groundbreaking and it's going to change. <laughs> and the teacher reflex in me was like, I don't want, I, this is, this is the struggle that I'd like to talk with, hopefully talk with you through is that I appreciate uh, expertise and, and advice being given um, and being out there and available. But the way this, the professional developments have been administered to teachers and aspiring teachers has really just sullied the water, uh, sullied the well. So there might be something good in there, but my motivation to go and drink from it is very low. Yeah, I totally understand that. And I think, um, you know, teachers 
have a low regard for most professional development with good reason. You know, there was a study called the Mirage by a group called TNTP that found the Mirage was that professional development was actually improving teaching and learning. It wasn't. I mean, they, you know, I think we spend $18 billion a year on teacher professional development. There's nothing to show for it. But yeah. it has been found that other kinds of professional development uh, can some certain kinds can work, not the standard. So the standard is something like half a, a one day or a half day workshop on something very general, like how to foster critical thinking. Yeah. And that doesn't work. So here's what, what could work. First of all, and, and you mentioned that, you, you know, curriculum, I do want to make the point that in order to really narrow the knowledge gap, I mean, teachers, individual teachers can, can do something, but because Building knowledge is a gradual cumulative process that extends across grade levels. What we really need is a logical, coherent, content-rich curriculum. So once you have that in place, that's the first step. Then professional development tied to the specifics of that curriculum can work. So not how to foster critical thinking in the abstract, but yeah. your kids are learning about the human digestive system or whatever, the myth of Daedalus and Icarus, how do you get them to think analytically, critically about that? And secondly, not a one day or a half day workshop, but something that is ongoing, you know, maybe coaching and cyclical where teachers maybe are coming together and talking about what they're trying and how it's going. That has been found to work much better. So um, I'm glad you mentioned um, PD. And I, I find myself unexpectedly on the sort of PD circuit now. I mean, that's- Yeah, yeah. I, I, or, that that's most of the requests for speaking that I get, you know, come from states, district schools. And I, I had no idea that this whole subculture existed. Um, and I don't pretend to be out there delivering training. I, I don't think anybody who's never taught K through 12 should be training teachers. But what I can do is, is just sort of talk about key points of, either the knowledge gap or the writing revolution or some combination of them. And then if teachers are interested, there's a lot more to do. But I've had people say, we'd like you to do a six hour workshop on, oh. I, no, I don't do that. And, you know, I, yeah. um, but I, I know people out there are, are I, I can't imagine anybody doing an effective six hour workshop, but, you may, you may have been at six hour workshops. And and with what I just described, I feel like you would be put in front of an audience that already doesn't like, doesn't, doesn't want to hear right out the gate. So I'll give you, I want to give you some time to talk about the writing revolution and how you created it. Yeah. What, no, yeah. I didn't. I mean, cause it's, it, it is not my method. Um, I'm the co-author and my, my co-author Judith Hockman it's her method. And she is a veteran educator. And she created this method over many years, basically trial and error, although it turns out that it really aligns with what cognitive science has found about how the mind works. And I would say how the writing process works, except there has been very little research on writing, certainly as compared to reading. But anyways, it is her method. And the way I, I mean, actually, she, if, if I had never met her, I probably would never have written The Knowledge Gap. Um, what happened was, as I said, I started out thinking that the problem was high school. And I thought, well, if I want to see what's going on in high schools, maybe I could tutor, do some tutoring. And I also thought, well, what, what can I tutor? Well, I'm a writer. I can, and writing's hard to teach, you know, it's hard to do. So I kids in writing. And I quickly discovered at this high poverty high school where I was working with four kids, first of all, they weren't getting any writing assignments. Um, secondly, when I gave them something to read and I asked them to write in response to it, not only were they struggling with the basics of writing, but they also often were not under, they were not understanding what they were reading because they lacked the background knowledge. And to me, they seemed like pretty straightforward things I was asking them to read. And then I read an article, um, this was in 2012 in the Atlantic called The Writing Revolution about this method of teaching writing that had turned around a very low performing high school in New York City, it really had helped to turn it around. And it taught kids, according to this article, both how to write and it also built their academic knowledge at the same time. And I thought, wow, this is what 
these kids need. Wouldn't it be great if the DC public school system would adopt this, but that'll never happen. But then lo and behold, I found out somebody in the DC public school system had read the same article and they were actually bringing Judy Hockman to DC to try to, it, there were some obstacles and but, but <laughs> try to bring it to DC. It, it hasn't really taken hold. Um, but, but for a couple of years, there were some schools that were, well, maybe three years, there were some schools that were doing very well with it. Anyway, I got to know Judy Hockman. I was also on the board of a charter school, an elementary school. And I, I said to Judy, you know, I'd really love this charter school to adopt your writing method. Could you look into that? And she came back to me and said, actually, this method only works if it's embedded in content. And your school isn't really teaching any content. And I was flabbergasted. I said, wow. what, what do you mean? It's a school. What are they teaching? And that started me on um, a path to writing the knowledge gap. But um, just to summarize what this method does, um, you know, writing, as I mentioned, is really hard. Um, it's harder than reading. It's expressive rather than receptive. And yet we've done a couple of things that, that um, make it even harder. One is we have asked kids to write at length from the get-go, we, you know, and, and it's overwhelming. Um, and we've also, we have not asked them to write about the content, assuming they are learning any content. We haven't asked them to write about the content that they're learning about. We might ask them to write personal narrative. That's been very popular. And they do know about that. But lately we've been asking them to write about things they don't really know much about, like in a separate writing curriculum, you know, here's three paragraphs on insects and now you write an essay about your favorite insect and you don't really know very much about insects and it's really hard. Yeah. It's also that approach is wasting a golden opportunity to use writing as a lever for building academic knowledge or deepening knowledge and having it cemented in long-term memory. Because when you write about something, you have to, it forces you to understand it and you really are much more likely to remember it. So our standard approaches have not worked to either build academic knowledge or enable kids to write well because it's so overwhelming. So what we need is an approach that first of all, modulates that heavy cognitive load that writing imposes by maybe starting at the sentence level, if that's what students need no matter what grade level they're in, because there are many students in high school who have never been taught explicitly how to construct a good sentence. Mm -hmm. And if you can't construct a good sentence, you're unlikely to be able to write a good essay. Yeah. Um, and then secondly, um, well, we also need to explicitly teach most kids grammar and writing conventions. That doesn't work in the abstract, but it also doesn't work to just expect them to pick it up for most kids. And the way the best, the really only effective way to teach grammar and conventions is in the context of students' own writing. And if you yeah. start at the sentence level, that's going to be much easier than if you've got five pages of error-filled prose coming back at you. And then lastly, to embed writing instruction and ac writing activities as much as possible in the content of the core curriculum so that we're using writing to build the knowledge we actually want kids to acquire. And I think as far as I know, the writing revolution is the only method that combines all three of these those things. And uh, and the book is, you know, it's a guide. It's kind of a step by step guide to implementing the method. There are also the writing revolution is also an organization, and they offer online courses for teachers that can be very helpful in in figuring out how to how to really use the method well. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. I mean, writing. I, it, it's, it's such a valuable treasure in my own life and teaching it. I like when you were talking about how you, there's, there needs to be an emphasis on teaching grammar uh, and spelling phonics too. Uh, one of the things that was having me rip the hair that isn't on my head while I was reading your book was Lucy Calkins take on, on, teaching writing because I kept, again, I kept flip-flopping. It's like, I agree with what you're saying in terms of having children have more freedom to express themselves in writing, but you do not have to compromise the, the, the discipline of minding your P's and Q's. Like I, I, I would, I, I don't know how, how does your, how does the writing revolution uh, treat mistakes and editing? 
Well, it's, um, as I mentioned, you know, if you start at the sentence level, it's, it's much easier to give prompt feedback on the state. And that's hugely important. So, um, but it's not, uh, you know, it, it's not teaching grammar for the sake of teaching grammar. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it is, there are certain grammatical concepts that have been selected um, because they provide a good shorthand for teachers and students. So, for example, there's a grammatical concept called the appositive, which, frankly, I'm not sure I was familiar with. Uh, um, might, it, yeah, <laughs> it's, a, it's a phrase that describes a noun, you know, and um, and so teachers might want students to vary their sentence structure and say, why don't you vary your sentence structure? But students may not know how to do that. But if a teacher says, how about adding in a positive to this sentence to vary your sentence structure. And they can just write APP. And the student will, I mean, will have been explicitly taught what an positive is, how to use it. And so it's it's really that kind of um, it makes feedback much easier and and correcting errors. I mean, there's there's some errors that kids are just going to make. You could teach them about a positives and they're still going to have run-on sentences and you need to correct those. And, and there are some activities that can help with students being able to recognize when a sentence should stop and what makes a complete sentence. Um, but it's not, a, it's not a matter of just giving students the definition of a sentence because that's yeah, no. too abstract for most students. I look at it as giving uh, students ingredients like, hey, here are the things you can make, uh, uh, make a dish with how you make that dish, here are the rules. <laughs> like don't turn on the stove at blazing hot. Like yeah, basically play with these as you want. And I would do exercises where all the students had whiteboards and it was almost like an ad lib situation where I would say, okay, I need the uh, preposition here, I need this. And then it would just be free form, here's what I wrote. And then they'd be laughing at each other's responses. Hmm. Um, and so I, I'm curious because this, well, Lucy Calkins is not the only person but the, the dismissal of being critical of children's work, not just in reading and writing, just across all subjects, is something that I feel, well, from my personal experience, it was trained from me uh, when I was going to teacher college. Uh, I'd like to read an excerpt from your book, uh, if that's okay, on sure. this, just to set it up. Sure. Uh, so you wrote, Although child-centered progressivism didn't have much effect on public schools in the early 20th century, it did have a huge impact on teacher training programs. Columbia University's teacher college became a bastion of progressivism and the country's most influential school of education, a position it arguably still holds today. The seeds of child-centered progressivism would lie dormant within America's teaching training institutions through the middle of the 20th century, ready to bloom when watered with the effusions of the do your own thing counterculture of the 1960s. And all through my two year or well, a year and a half of the, at the College of Education, just constantly told you can't, don't, don't mess with the child's self esteem. You were not doing anything with malice, but uh, the student is allowed to choose what exactly what they want to do how they want to do it, try to avoid calling out their mistakes because you might get in the way of them falling in love with what they're doing. Um, my perspective is that, you know, it's, there is a benefit. I, I, my approach is I, I'm fine with having the children, the child in the passenger seat, but they will not touch the steering wheel and they won't know where we're going. I know where we're going, but um, yeah, I, I, I would like to know your your take on how teachers are trained from the outside looking in. Yeah. 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 Well, actually, you know, I I, um, I thought of, I'm not going to do this, but I thought of writing another book specifically on teacher training and, and how it has departed from what cognitive scientists have found about how people learn. I didn't I decided I just didn't have it in me. That would be a difficult <laughs> to write. And I would very much encourage you or somebody who's actually been through ed school to write that book. I, I um, only got an article so far, but a whole book okay. seems like a challenge, but go ahead. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a tough story. I did write um, an article for the called the American last December about teacher training institutions and schools. And, um, you know, I think it's very appealing that, that 
philosophy of let you know let's be child centered does not sound great and let kids just direct their own learning and po follow their own interests and passions it, it, yeah. it, it's, it's appealing sounds good and it's also easy right because very easy you don't really have to do very much but unfortunately it it really doesn't work very well for most kids i mean you don't have the exceptional kid who already who comes in like you know self-disciplined and motivated and with a lot of background knowledge and just could but most kids are not like that and you know i think this is um it does it, it's all i believe well intentioned but it makes teachers job so much harder than they need to be and it makes kids' jobs as students harder as well. It just makes teaching and learning more difficult. Um, but there are historical reasons for uh, you know this divergence between ed schools and the rest of academia. Yes. Um, you know, ed schools most of them started out as normal schools that took girls mostly who had only an eighth grade education and just trained them to teach the basics of reading, writing, and arithmetic. And those normal schools then morphed into state teachers' colleges, and some of them became state universities. But ed schools, the rest of academia has long looked down on ed schools. Yes. It's easier to get in there. It's, you know, the faculty doesn't isn't held to as high standards. And of course, that has led to ed school faculty having something of a chip, understandably, on their shoulders. You know, That's like, true. So the two cultures just don't really communicate, and. Um, you know, I, what I wrote about in this article for the American Scholar, um, I, you know, there is a very sort of nascent effort to try to get ed schools to change their curricula so that they're actually teaching things that align with cognitive science. But it's going to be a long time before. I mean, there may be 10 programs, not even 10 ed schools, but last I checked, just 10 programs out of thousands in the United States that were trying to do this. And they, it might be just one course. So um, I think uh, what we need to, we can't wait for ed schools to change. Yeah. Difficult as it is, we kind of need to retrain teachers on the job and, uh, you know, get them to, you know, repudiate essentially everything they've been told in it or not everything but many of the things they may have 90 percent <laughs> almost in the yeah. in the teacher college in the teacher college yeah um i mean the other problem is that in uh, you may have gotten a graduate degree did you get a graduate degree in teaching you got a master's with a teaching credential right yeah and so at least you had i you had four years of undergraduate education before you got these you know these education courses but most elementary teachers just get an undergraduate degree in elementary education. And they often yes. take in very many substantive courses. They may not themselves know much about history or science or whatever. So that is also a problem if we're expecting them to teach those things. Yeah, you're, you, you said it. And I, I was, I've, it's hard to talk about this uh, topic without, um, coming off as well I'm sitting here in teacher college and I understand everything that's going on and it, it's it's more of when I was sitting in a teacher college and the college of education I was more like this is not this is not difficult at all like it, it should be difficult like for example I wouldn't take notes I, I, I love taking notes in class and I had my notebook ready to go but conversations would be these things that or these these ideas that seem like common sense like you should not shame a child in class okay yeah but what would be a better use of the class time was would be to probably talk about the value of shaming is it is is there value in shaming if you do have to shame a child how much should you do or how much shame is there a healthy of, amount of shame like there's no philosophical discussion on the practices i do want a uh, hard data that proves certain practices work. That's that's much appreciated, but there's no deliberation in those classrooms on what we're doing, and it 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 bothered me. And what you're talking about uh, in terms of students coming straight from College of Education for their undergrad right into the masters. I graduated with communi in communication studies in at Marquette like five years, four years before I. No, yeah, four years before I went into my master's, I lived a little, and and 
I can't imagine going straight from education undergrad to education masters with no living in between. And this is the question that I wanted to ask to you, what terrified me through those, uh, through those three years, not a lot of teachers read, not even in the teaching training, just in general. And if you are a teacher that reads awesome, we need more of that. But man, like I, if they do read, it's like Harry Potter or the latest, uh, the latest New York times bestseller in fiction. It, I would feel like a dork being like, Hey, what do you, what did you do this weekend? Oh, I read crime and punishment. <laughs> it's just kind of this, how, how, how can you expect to teach reading and writing when you, d you will, don't even practice those skills or volunteer to practice those skills in your personal life? It's like being a t PE teacher, but very unhealthy. It doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, American adults generally don't read any books. Um, I saw some about that. Um, and, you know, teachers, I think one problem, it's not, I don't want to blame, as I said, I don't think it's yeah. individual teachers' fault. And I think yes. that one big problem here is that we are trying to fix a defective system with the products of that same defective. Yes. yes. So it's kind of a vicious cycle. Um, yeah. And I think actually, though, from what I've seen, what can break that cycle is a good content rich curriculum that educates the teacher. A lot. I mean, the teacher is learning things from that curriculum. It's not ideal. It's better to know these things before you teach them and not just be one step ahead of the students. But so that could make for a difficult first year. But by the second or third year, you know, you are going to feel more comfortable with that material. You might be able to make it your own. You know, for example, the curriculum that I um, observed because it was the only one around at the time I was researching the book is Cornell's Language Arts. And for no, it has some very sophisticated material. Second graders, for example, learn about the War of 1812. If you ask the average American, you stop somebody on the street and say, tell me about the War of 1812, you will probably get a blank look. And there are going to be a lot of second grade teachers who don't know anything about the War of 1812, but they learn a lot about it. And the kids, by the way, in that second grade class were fascinated by it. So, um, you know, I, I, teachers have told me that they've learned, they learned a lot of history from teaching that curriculum. And so I think that's our best hope that it, it can educate the teachers one step ahead of the students. Uh, so I, I'd like to, I'd like to talk to you about curriculum because you're talking about there needs to be a content, there needs to be more focus on the content. And I think you were in, in the book and correct me if I'm wrong, you were trying to make a point that there's value in having uh, some uniformity in curriculum across the nation, like like in, in other in other in terms of just having designated checkpoints that everyone in the in the country should should go through. So that way there's a uniform of knowledge. Well, most developed countries do have a national curriculum, yes. fairly detailed and that makes life, that makes teaching and learning easier. Yes. And if, so if you switch schools, you're not suddenly like, I don't know what's going on. Um, but I don't think that that's possible in the United States. Okay. Um, we just, our system is such that education is traditionally a matter of state control and even local control. But states can do a lot. And some of them have and are doing a lot. Um, and, and, and districts can do a lot as well. But um, so the state of Louisiana started maybe almost 10 years ago now um, with uh, encouraging, you know, they, they didn't require, you will, all teachers will use this curriculum, but the, the state created a pretty good content rich curriculum and they brought teachers along. They sort of educated them about why this was important and really, uh, I, and I have heard that about 80% of the classrooms in the state are using, the, I, I think it's that state created curriculum, although there are also other curricula that have been highly rated, but so they, they have a choice, but they're, and actually if you get 80, we haven't talked about this, but if you get, you know, 80% of the classrooms in the, the state using the same curriculum, then you can tie your state reading tests to the topics in that curriculum. That's awesome. Um, 
So that instead of testing kids basically on the knowledge they may have happened to pick up, <laughs> you're testing them on the knowledge that they have acquired in school. And it makes it a much better experience for the students, certainly, um, that they're, re you know, they're reading passages either from books they've read as part of the curriculum, and not just in English and social studies as well, or on topics that they're at least familiar with. And um, so, you know, not every state's going to be able to do that, but um, other states could and other states have, like Tennessee, for example, encourage districts to adopt one of a, a group of a set of approved content with knowledge and curricula. And they can, even if states don't, if there's not one single curriculum throughout the state, every state has academic standards. And the, the reading tests have been tied to the ELA standards, which don't specify any content. But Very vague. Than, yeah. yeah, so rather than tying the test to those standards, tie them to the content in the social studies standards, the content in the science standards, base the reading passages on those topics. I think that's a second best move and it could make a big difference. I was very fascinated by uh, your, what you, the information you brought up about Louisiana in the book. I thought, wow, that's why, and you said, why is it it seems so obvious to prepare them for the specific material that they know will be on the assessment. I didn't know there was an 80%. If you get 80% of the districts to comply with the curriculum that you can, you can write the assessment. No. Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, I should mention though, this is just a pilot and experimental. It's not okay. it's for a subgroup of districts um, at the middle, just at the middle school level. Now this, this, it's, I think it's called an innovative assessment. It's part of, it's under ESSA. Um, so it's not statewide, but you know, uh, it, let's hope it's, it's depending on the results they get, which of course the whole thing has been kind of derailed by the pandemic. So yes, yes. Really have results yet, but uh, you know, it could, it could become standard. It could become the whole state. It could become every, every grade level that's tested. We'll see. Yeah. When I when I got into when I got into teaching, I I was originally my original pursuit out of college was to be in radio and broadcasting, and I worked for Clear Channel uh, at the time. And I remember finding a, an an article uh, in back in two thousand that was published back in two thousand three of people protesting outside the building because the FCC was gonna uh, back off um, media ownership so that way they can buy huge swaths of stations. And when I got into teaching, I always had that in mind because when that happened, uh, when Clear Channel was just allowed to buy s large chunks of stations, the, the personality, the, the intimacy between radio host and the, the, their clientele, it, it was just watered down dramatically for the sake of what was efficient and for the sake of what, what was guaranteed to work. Um, and I guess that is my, my, that's the way I would articulate some of the reservations towards Common Core. I personally agree with you that they're very vague in what they call for, but I was always weary of, of someone from outside the classroom, out far as the farther you get away from the classroom, being told what to do in your classroom uh it just it didn't make sense to me and i i think that if you're just coming up with the standards at a state level even at a local level that's much better than at a at a federal level uh but like you like you said there's still complications with <laughs> interest and just the motivations of adults in the room and it kind of just loses track yes and I, we don't have I don't think we have time to get into this, but there's now, you know, there's a lot of political agitation <laughs> around right. yeah. like social studies standards, um, which is, it worries me that uh, people will just back off from specifying content because they don't want to be, you know, political targets for political attacks. And that would be really unfortunate. I mean, I, it's understandable, yeah. but it's going to really, kids will suffer. I'll quickly say I had, uh, I had uh, someone from the district come into the classroom and she was Latina and it's weird because the color of my skin the, the, sometimes I feel like people look at me and immediately like you're on board with what we're trying to do here and 
it, it's this weird wink, wink, nudge, nudge. And this, this individual straight up told me in regards to teaching social studies and how I should teach it. Uh, she gave me all the alternative materials. And then she said, uh, we're trying to change the social paradigm. And I'm like, I love history. And I, I think there's absolutely value in teaching it. But I told my students, I'm like, do not go through uh, reading his, do not read history with a gavel in hand. You are not, you are not the arbiter of justice. And I, and I told them, how many of you know the Mayans? And they all raised their hands. And I'm like, the Mayans uh, had influence over agriculture and mathematics that have stood the test of time. Beautiful civilization that we still celebrate to this day. They also sacrificed human beings. How ridiculous would it be for me to uh, say, well, they uh, killed their, their fellow beings to human sacrifice. There is nothing we can learn from this civilization. And they, they laughed. And for someone to come in, someone who works with new teachers, this person works with new teachers and guides them through teaching these subjects, for someone to come in and just say, try to change the social paradigm, that I, I share your concern. I totally share your concern. Yeah, I mean, I think um, it's, it's, it's a tough um, conundrum in a way because I think people are very they, sincere and passionate and, um, it's hard. I think what we have to do is, first of all, you know, um, not apply present day standards to everything that happened in the past. Yeah. And also realize that the important thing to teach about history is that it's complicated, not, not good, bad. It's complicated. And I think there are facts that are generally agreed upon by historians that should be presented as facts. And then there are perspectives that people can debate about. And we have to be able, and those yes. perspectives should be brought in, you know, yeah. that's what makes history so interesting. But adopting one perspective on the past as the truth when it's not generally accepted by lots of people will be problematic and will yeah. cause blowback. Yeah. So. And I, I'll, I, I, completely agree. I, I was weary of the CRT talks just as much as I was of the anti-CRT response. It was just as ham-fisted in terms of, well, we can't talk about any of this stuff, but there, there's, you got to find the balance people. There, there is, there is power in exploring these uncomfortable occurrences in history. So uh, I am very thankful for your time. Thank you for this interview. Uh, I, there was a few questions I wasn't able to get to, but I did want to ask this one last question. Sure. Outside of education and academics, what is the definition? What is the value of reading and writing in your, in your own personal life? If you had no audience and you were just doing these things for your own pleasure, why is it so vital to your life? Well, lots of reasons. I mean, reading for, you know, reading novels is one thing that has enriched my life and writing yes. novels, you know. Yeah. Um, but I would say that when it comes to reading and writing generally, especially writing, I mean, it makes life richer and it helps me understand the world. Yes. Um, so, and I want everybody to have that experience, you know. I guess yeah. that's how I sum it up. Okay. Well that's a great answer. And yeah, I again thank you for coming on the coming on the show. Uh to the viewer, if you like this video, subscribe. Uh this will come out on Friday. And uh thank you for watching. Thank you, Nico. This was fun.